Good morning, everyone. My name is Lauren Abner, and I'm the technology consultant here at KDLA. Uh, most of you know me from E-rate form filing. That is my primary duty. And today we're going to talk about invoicing, um, what the different options are, how you actually get that started. And we're going to attempt to have a live walkthrough of filing the Form 486. I'm actually going to risk filing KDLA's Form 486 live, which will definitely not result in any kind of issues, I'm sure. Now, for uh, those of you who received the last email I sent this morning, a copy of the slides in PDF format were attached. Those will also be posted on the website later. If you're looking at the slides, uh, to try to file the Form 486 or look at invoicing options from this presentation. The second slide in the PDF has links where you can jump to the section of the instructions that you'd like to see. Before we really get started on the information, I always like to give a disclaimer. Um, I do not work for the Federal Communications Commission nor the Universal Service Administrative Company. So, what I provide to you today is my unofficial interpretation of the rules for the E-rate program, and I will be logged in live to the E-rate Productivity Center, but it's always possible that something about the navigation may change. There's always some kind of little tweak to the system, so just keep that in mind. I usually like to start my E-rate presentations by kind of orienting people to where we are in the funding year. Uh, if you want to, to download a copy of the most recent E-rate funding years chart, uh, you can find that on the KDLA website. I'm adding the link in the chat right now. So I'm about due to create another one of these funding year charts, um, but we're still on this one at the moment. And you can see in the bottom row here in yellow that talks about the dates for funding year 2021 which normally covers the time period of July 1st, 2021 to June 30th of 2022. So we've already gone through the competitive bidding process and everyone has submitted their applications to request discounts. Application review is still underway. Many of you have already received your funding commitment decision letter, which brings us to the Form 486, uh, the last little stop before you actually get to the invoicing options for category one and category two. Okay, so let's talk about that funding commitment decision letter in case that's something you haven't received yet or you just weren't sure about that file that you received by email. So what is a funding commitment? When USEC reviews your Form 471, um, they will send a funding commitment de decision letter to indicate how much funding has been committed for that particular application and the amount for each funding request. And a funding commitment doesn't mean that you're going to get every single dollar that was committed to your library. Basically, it means that on the application form, you estimated the cost for those services during the funding year. And so based on the actual invoicing, there is a maximum amount that you can see receive as reimbursement. So if your actual costs for something come in lower than what you originally estimated, you'll get your appropriate discount rate on the actual charges. And then if you are unfortunately charged more than expected, you'll end up getting your maximum refund, but you'll be out the difference. So the funding commitment decision letter comes by email and um, and usually those funding commitments are issued kind of every Thursday, starting about a month after the deadline for the Form 471. So at this point, a little over half of Kentucky libraries have received their funding commitments. And I anticipate that almost every library will have their funding commitment before the funding year begins on July 1st. So besides getting it in an email, you can also look up your funding commitment decision letter in the E-Rate Productivity Center portal. There's a section on the landing page for notifications. 
You, you can set the notification type to funding commitment decision letter and choose the appropriate funding year, in this case, 2021. You'll get a grid with results. And in the far right hand column, you'll have a view notification option so that you can download that file. And that will take you to the entry as it appears on your newsfeed. So at the bottom of the entry, you have an option to download a PDF copy that's easy to print and read. The same information is also provided in an Excel format, but it's not really formatted to be easily printed. And just very quickly, we, we're not going to go through an entire funding commitment decision letter, but just to let you know, on the first page, it will indicate the total amount of funding committed for that particular application. On subsequent pages, you'll see an overview for each individual funding request. So if you have more than one funding request on an application, you'll see whether that particular uh, request was funded. There may also be notes about changes that were made during application review. A lot of times the note will just say approved, you know, as submitted, if no changes were made. Uh, but occasionally you'll see notes if an adjustment, uh, you know, was made to the amount of funding or a change to, you know, the service type or some kind of other detail about the funding request. Another way to look up your funding information if you just want a quick at a glance um, overview of your funding is to look on E-Rate Central. Let me go ahead and grab a link to their state page and put that in the chat. Just one sec. There we go. So E-Rate Central is a consulting company and they download the public information for the E-Rate program. And then they post it on their website in a format that I think is easier to look at than some of USAC's databases. So if you go to their state page, which I've linked in the chat, they have a funding quick search where you can enter the build entity number for your library system. And then you get a page that shows all the various funding years. In the left hand column, you can select the funding year you'd like to look at more specifically and see more details about each funding request. So that's usually where I look for information about uh, libraries E-rate filing when you guys call me, just so have a, I have a quick idea of what funding year we're talking about and which funding request, that's almost always where I go. So now that you have your funding commitments, let's talk about the options for invoicing. So in E-rate parlance, we call those invoicing modes. So there are two invoicing modes and you, know, you often have an opportunity to select which type of invoicing you'd like for each particular funding request. It's important to note that each funding year is a new opportunity to make a selection for the type of invoicing. So just because last year you selected uh, to file your own bare forms for reimbursement, that doesn't mean that you have to keep doing that you know, in subsequent years. So every year is a new opportunity to decide, decide for each funding request number. So in the following slide, we'll talk about those two options, which are service provider invoicing or SPY and build entity applicant reimbursement or bear. It's important to note that once invoicing forms are filed and the funding starts being released, um, you are locked into that particular invoicing mode for the entire funding year. Uh, it's very, very difficult to change the invoicing mode if something were to happen. So anticipate that once you get rolling on a particular mode, that's what you're doing for that funding request for the entire year. The so first up is service provider invoicing or SPY. This is where your service provider will apply the E-rate discounts to your invoice up front, and then they will bill you the difference. So for example, if you have a 90% discount on your internet, if your service provider applied that up front, you will be paying 10% of the eligible cost plus any ineligible fees for that service. So it's kind of nice because the app really puts the paperwork burden on the service provider, 
uh, because they will have to turn around and file their own invoicing forms with USAC in order to be reimbursed for the discounts they applied to you up front. Uh, so, of course, there are a couple of warnings about that. Uh, technically, uh, service providers don't have to offer SPY unless that was specified at the time that the contractor agreement was made. And to be perfectly honest, there are a lot of smaller vendors who just really aren't set up to do that. They might only have one or two customers that participate in the E-rate program. So sometimes, even though it should be an option for you, it may effectively not be depending on the provider that you're working with. Uh, for pretty major vendors, you know, your AT&T's, Spectrum, Windstream, you know, those kind of companies, they have a department that handles their E-rate invoicing. So it's very possible to set up spy forms. Uh, you may have to fill out some additional paperwork or some kind of online form in order to opt in to spy discounts for that particular provider. So that's their own separate paperwork, not something for the official E-rate program. Also, once you make that selection, it may take two to three billing cycles for the discounts to actually begin to show up on those invoices. Um, but they can make it retroactive to July 1st of the funding year. So if they don't get started right away in July, it may be that one of your invoices has several credits on it and uh, it all works out by the end of the funding year. The other invoicing mode is the bare form. And that is what you, the library files, after paying the full invoice up front. So it is still filed in the legacy invoicing system, the old fashioned looking form, uh, but it gets the job done. So you can file a bear form as often as you're invoiced. So if you want to file a bear form every month after paying your monthly internet bill, you can do that. Uh, some libraries will choose to file quarterly, some every six months, and quite a few libraries just wait until the end of the funding year after all invoices are paid, and they just file one bear form to be reimbursed for the entire funding year. Uh, so there's you know, it's really up to your choice what is most convenient for your library. The deadline for filing a bear form to be reimbursed is 120 days after the funding year ends. So in late October, on October 28th, that's the typical invoicing deadline for most E-rate applicants. So you hear a lot from me in September and October encouraging you to make sure that invoicing is completed. You do have an option to request an extension on invoicing to give you an extra 120 days. You just need to make that particular request before the deadline. So the nice thing about bare forms is that it gives you more control over the invoicing. Uh, you may not have to wait so long for a service provider to get started on discount. You're just going to handle it yourself. But it does involve more paperwork, more review, things like that. That's just a trade-off. Okay, so now that we've talked about invoicing modes, let's talk about that last pesky form that you need to file before you can actually start invoicing. And that is the Form 486. So the Form 486 has a few purposes. You use that form to indicate the service start dates for each funding request. You make a certification regarding your library's compliance with the Children's Internet Protection Act, and you are formally accepting and releasing the funding committed to your library so that it can be invoiced. So in order for any invoicing forms to be filed, whether it's a spy form filed by your service provider or a bear form filed by your library, there has to be a Form 486 on file and approved that lists that particular funding request. If the Form 486 is missing, then the invoicing form will be rejected. So the deadline for the Form 486 can vary based on when the services are starting and when the funding commitment decision letter was issued. So most services for libraries start on July 1st of the funding year, and most of you will have your funding commitment before July 1st. So the overwhelming majority of Kentucky Public Libraries will need to file their 
funding year 2021 Form 486 by October 29, 2021. Maybe a few exceptions, but in general, when you ask me the deadline, I'm going to say it's October 29th. If you want to look up your library's particular situation, you can go to the deadline tool on the USAC website. You enter the date of your funding commitment decision letter and the date the services are starting, and the tool will calculate your actual deadline for the Form 486. Now, most Kentucky Public Libraries will have the option to early file the Form 486. Early filing basically just means you're filing the form by July 31st. So you need to meet all the conditions. You can't file a Form 486 until you receive your funding commitment decision letter. Uh, the services listed on the funding request need to be starting in July. And then you can truthfully make all of the certifications on the form, including SIPA compliance, if that's required for your funding. And then you need to be filing the form for 86 um, on or before July 31st. So again, most of you will have that option. If you don't early file, that's okay. Um, it would delay the start of E-rate invoicing. Uh, you just need to make sure you get it filed by the deadline. Let's talk a little bit about the service start dates. So for recurring services, um, usually we're talking about your category one internet and sometimes category two maintenance for your equipment. Um, the service dates need to be between July 1st and June 30th of the relevant funding year. And almost always the service start date is going to be July 1st, unless you've got a situation where say an old contract is ending and your library is going month to month or maybe a new contract picks up. But overwhelmingly, it's gonna be July 1st. Now for non-recurring services, meaning one-time purpose, purpose <laughs> let me try this again, one-time purchases like category two equipment, um, the service start date is probably still going to be July 1st. And that's true even if you decide to make the purchase and installation during the early purchase period, which, which opens on April 1st uh, before the funding year begins. On the Form 486, you're reporting the earliest possible service start dates, and you can't enter a date that is prior to the start of the funding year. And the best practice for Category 2 funding um, even if you're not sure you're going to make the purchase on July 1st, you list July 1st as the earliest possible date. I know that seems weird, uh, but just go with it. If you have questions, let me know. And again, there are some advanced installation options. So for category one, say you're setting up a new fiber internet service, uh, the work to get that set up for the first time can occur uh, up to six months before the funding year begins. However, you can't actually invoice any of the discounts for that advanced installation until the funding year begins on July 1st. And then for category two, the early purchase installation period begins on April 1st prior to the start of the funding year. Uh, you also have a late installation option uh, that goes through September 30th following the end of the funding year. So if you opt for early purchase for category two, likely your service provider can't apply the discounts up front. Uh, you should anticipate paying the full amount of the invoice and then waiting until at least July 1st to file a bearer form to be reimbursed for those costs. So a question I often get is how many form Forms 486 do you need to file? So that can vary. Uh, you may file one Form 486 if you've received the funding commitment decision letters for all of your applications. So it's perfectly fine to list funding requests from several different applications on the same Form 486 if you're ready to make the relevant certifications for all of those uh, funding requests. Sometimes you may need to file multiple forms if you don't get your funding commitments at the same time. Say you're ready to start invoicing for a particular funding request, 
and you're still waiting to hear about funding on another application, you could go ahead and file one Form 4086 and then file another one later. Uh, you may also do that if you've got some uncertainty about the service start date. Um, so you might go ahead and list a few of your funding requests and wait and file another when you've got more certainty about a service start date. As a reminder, you are making a certification regarding SIPA compliance. Uh, almost all Kentucky Public Libraries need to comply with SIPA in order to receive E-rate funding. So if you get Category 1 discounts on your, on your internet access, you have to be SIPA compliant. Or if you request anything Category 2, whether it's equipment or some kind of maintenance service, anything like that, you must be SIPA compliant. Uh, the one exception is if your library requests discounts only on transport ser services uh, that connect your branches. So the example would be Lexington Public Library. They request discounts only on the transport circuits that connect all of their branches, and then they pay for the internet access separately. So as a reminder for SIPA compliance, there are three major points you need to hit. You have to have an internet safety policy that addresses certain elements regarding children's safe use of the library's internet. At some point, um, when you put that policy into effect, you needed to have a um, public notice and hearing to allow the community to provide input on your internet safety policy. Most importantly, you need to be filtering. So you have some kind of technology protection measure that allows you to block certain visual images as required by SIPA. So that would be obscenity, child pornography, or certain sexual material that may be harmful to minors. So if you have any questions, um, you know, please feel free to contact me about uh, SIPA compliance. Um, it's very important that you make the correct certification and that you are truly compliant. If it were discovered that you weren't actually compliant during a particular period and you accepted E-rate funds, you may have to repay funds to the program if you're found to be non-compliant. I have an older webinar on filtering. It's posted on uh, the archived webinars page of KDLA's websites. I'll probably be offering that training again soon, but in the meantime, just contact me directly if you're not sure. Okay, so this is the part where we are going to do a walkthrough of the Form 486. So we're going to see if I can get Blackboard Collaborate to show my screen correctly. So just a moment while I get that switched. Let's see. Oh, actually, you know what? I better just share my entire screen. Okay, here we go. My apologies. Okay, so let me switch over to another tab. So hopefully you're just seeing this one page for the E-Rate Productivity Center portal and not a whole bunch of infinitely repeating screens. So uh, when you go to log into the portal, uh, the first page you see um, asks you to you know, continue. It's just a notice about the fact that uh, USAC uses multi-factor authentication for this particular site. So I'm going to scroll down to the bottom of the screen and I'm going to click on this blue continue button. And then that takes me to a more traditional login page. So I'm logging in as a, an applicant for the program on behalf of KDLA. So I already have my browser remembering my username and my password. And then I need to check the box to accept the basic terms and conditions before logging into the site. And I'll click on the blue sign in button. Now, depending on what options you've set up, this is the point where things may differ a little bit. Uh, by default, uh, when you log into the site, you have an option to get a one-time verification code via email. Once you get into the portal and there's a dashboard, uh, you would have an option to add text messages uh, in order to receive your codes. 
So I'm going to choose text message in this particular instance. So it's got my phone number already stored for that purpose, and I'll click on send passcode. If you're using email as your option, you can click on send email. So just a moment while I wait for my little passcode to come through. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so my code is 556552. All right, and I'm going to click on verify. And that's going to take me to a dashboard. Now, again, this is unfortunately the part where people may see different things uh, because why have a consistent experience for everyone? So this is what's called the One Portal Dashboard. So on the dashboard, I have options to you know, look at particular settings for you know, my account. Um, and I have options to go to two different portals. So my email is associated both with the E-Rate Productivity Center and with the legacy bear form, because I file invoicing forms for KDLA. Now, if you only have access to the E-Rate Productivity Center, you won't see a page exactly like this. You'll just see a little box that gives you an option to manage your settings or continue on to the E-Rate Productivity Center. So depending on your option, um, I'm going to click on E-Rate Productiv Productivity Center to access the portal. And that will take me to the good old applicant landing page that we're used to. Okay. So on the applicant landing page, the fastest way to start a Form 486 is to look at this cluster of links toward the upper right and click on the link that says FCC Form 486. Now we'll start a new form in another tab in your browser. All right, so I've got a fresh form. The system automatically pulls the details about my library as far as the you know, address, the phone number, got my build entity number, so I don't have to worry about that because it's pulled from my profile. So the first field to enter is just a nickname for your form 486. So I usually put something about the funding year. So I'll put funding year uh, 2021 to 2022, and I'm going to put category one. Delay only requested category one funds this year. You might end up adding something like and two, uh, category two, if you have funding commitments for you know, both categories of service. For the right, there's a drop down for the funding year, and you'll select 2021. Remember, E-rate abbreviates by the starting funding year rather than the fiscal year ending. At the lower left, there's a section for contact information. Under main contact person, if I just start typing the first few letters of my name, you can see this box that pops up that shows my full name and email. I'll click on the box and it pulls in my individual user profile information uh, from my account. And then I'm ready to continue. You'll see that uh, the details about KDLA will appear at the top of each page. So now we're to select FRNs. This is where we add the particular funding requests that we want to include on this Form 486. And the first thing you see are these filter fields. So by default, these filters are set up to show only the 2021 funding request numbers that have actually been funded. And the results appear in this grid below. You have two options for adding the funding requests um, to this particular form. If you look just below the filter fields on the left hand side, there's a white button that says add all number FRNs. So in this case, it says add all one FRNs because I have only one funded funding request. But you may see an option that says add all two FRNs or add all three. So that's one way to do it. Another option, which is useful if you want to select some of your funding re requests but not all of them, would be to check the box by the particular funding request in the grid. And then at the lower right, you'll click on add one FRN, add two FRN, just however, however many funding requests you checked. But I'm just going to use the add all one FRNs option. So once I click on that button, if I scroll down the screen, 
there's another section that displays the selected FRNs. So this basically confirms to me what I've, what I've added to this Form 486. Now, while it's tempting, you don't need to check any additional buttons. If you added a funding request in error and you want to remove it, you would check the box to the left of the funding request number and click on the Remove FRNs button. But uh, this is exactly what I want to see under Selected FRNs, so I'm just going to click on Continue. All right, the next page has some service information details. So in the grid, all of the funding requests I added will appear. And in the right-hand columns, you'll see the service start date as indicated on the application form. In this case, it was July 1st, 2021. And then a column for actual service start dates. Now, actual service start date is sort of a funny bit of wording on the old paper version of these forms or the form you used to file in the legacy systems. It would say the um, earliest possible service start date. And that's really what they're asking for. Um, so again, most services, unless you've got some kind of change in purchase type in the middle of the year, uh, most of your funding requests will start on July 1st of the funding year. Now, if you need to make a change to a particular funding request, you'll check the box to the left of the funding request number, and then you can put in a different date for start of services. Let's say I know, for example, that there's going to be a delay in setting up a new internet service, so my service won't begin until August 1st of the funding year. So if I needed to do that, I could select that date and click Update Selected FRN Start Date. But I don't need that option. July 1st is exactly what I want. So I'm just going to uncheck the box, and I'll continue. All right, the page after that uh, has, it starts the certification section. So this first page has two options. The first is early filing. Basically, your services are starting in July, and you're filing this form by July 31st. So this year, most Kentucky Public Libraries and KDLA will be early filing their forms, or at least have that as an option. The other option on this page is SIPA waiver. That's extremely rare, and I can't think of any library that would need to select this certification. This basically is an option if you were supposed to already be compliant with uh, SIPA, and this is the second year since 2001, you're, you're requesting funding that requires SIPA compliance. But again, this is just extremely rare. You should not be checking this particular waiver request. So you'll have options to send for certification if someone else in your library system, like the director, will actually need to certify the form. But almost all of you should have the permission level in the system to go ahead and make the certifications yourself. So most of you will just click on the option to continue. So we get yet more certifications. On the next page, uh, this option that just says certifications, there are two options. Um, so you're going to go ahead and check both of them. They're basically saying, yes, the services will be starting for our eligible library. And you know I have the authority to make the certification. Um, there's also sort of a funny sounding one about making sure that the discount rate um, is appropriate for the school or library receiving the service. It's kind of awkward. It also talks about document retention. So just go ahead and check those. Those are certifications that everyone needs to make. And the bottom section for the SIPA certification has three options and you can select only one. So almost every single library should be making the first certification that your library complies with the Children's Internet Protection Act, because generally what you're receiving funding for does require SIPA compliance. Uh, there is an option um, for libraries that haven't participated in E-rate since 2001. Uh, they do have an option to kind of skip their certification for this year um, and instead say that they are still working on becoming SIPA compliant. So there's one library that might do that this year, and that would be Paul Sawyer Public Library. And then very rarely, there's an option to say that SIPA doesn't apply to the funding that you're requesting. 
So right now, the only library I can think of would be Lexington Public. So unless you're Paul Sawyer or Lexington Public, you should be selecting the first certification. You'll then be ready to click on the blue preview button at the lower right hand corner of the screen. Now we'll change the page so that you're seeing all of the entries from the Form 486 together on one page. So this is just sort of your chance to you know, review the information that you've entered. The Form 486 is very short and the trickiest information uh, relates to the funding request numbers. The system handled that for you. So there's not much of anything to review. Uh, if you are early filing the Form 486, you should see four certifications listed. The early filing option, the two basic certifications that everyone makes, and then the certification related to SIPA. If you file your Form 486 later in the year, you might only see three certifications. So everything seems good to me. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this blue certify button. And then I get that usual pop up warning. Um, to alert me that making false statements on this form will make me subject to some sort of criminal prosecution. I'm also certifying that I am authorized to represent the entity listed on this form, meaning KDLA. So I'm going to go ahead and say yes. So right after you certify, you'll see the certifier information page. And you'll have a link that says click here to view and print the FCC form 486. So I'm going to go ahead and follow the link. This will take me to the E-Rate Productivity Center record for my particular form 486. So the top here, you can see the nickname I gave to the form and then the number assigned to my particular form. Now the form 486 is sort of the weirdo form that doesn't have a nice PDF copy like almost all of the rest of the E-Rate forms that you file. So if I'm going to print this, for my records, I'm going to need to scroll down and at the lower right hand corner, there's a print preview button. It's kind of weird. You click on print preview and it gives you this pop up, you know, asking if you want to expand the certification section so you can print this. And I do want to do that. So I'm going to say yes. So now you can see the certifications that I selected on this particular form. You'll notice that a whole bunch of other certifications uh, appear and the boxes aren't checked beside them. So the system automatically showed me only the certifications that were relevant to a library applicant. It didn't show me ones that pertain to schools or to consortia. So in order to you know, print this page, you, know, you can just do your file print option or hit control P on your keyboard. And you may want to do two things. Uh, you may want to just print to your regular printer so you have a paper copy for your records. Um, but if you want to save an electronic copy instead, you might change the printer option to something like Save to PDF or Microsoft Print to PDF so that you can instead save a copy where you need it. So I'll go ahead and do that because I like to keep electronic copies of KDLA's records. And uh, I'll go ahead and put this in my special folder for KDLA E-Rate filing for 2021. So that's saved so I can access it later. I can always go back to the record in the system for this particular form 486 and print another copy if needed. So that's just printing the form itself. There's another particular um, notification from USAC that you will print. So I'm going to go ahead and close this tab in my browser. And back on the landing page, I can access the Form 486 notification letter. I will also receive this as an email. The email will have two attachments. One is a PDF copy of the notification letter, which just means that my Form 486 was approved. There's also an Excel file but it's really not formatted for printing. It's what service providers use with their automated invoicing systems. So on the landing page, if I want to access my notification letter, which should be issued right away if I've selected the correct certifications, I'm going to scroll down a little bit to the section that's labeled notifications. There's a drop down for notification type. So I'll go ahead and select the FCC Form 486 Notification Letter. 
And then I'll have to, oh, this one, it just shows me all of the 486 notification letters that have been issued for various funding years. So you can see now that the top entry in this grid is for the notification letter issued today. Uh, so if I want to go ahead and view that, rather than waiting for it to come by email, I'm gonna click on view notification, and that takes me to a news feed entry. You'll notice at the bottom, I've got a link to a PDF copy of my notification letter, and I also have a link to the Excel file, which again, is difficult to print. So you just wanna make sure you save a version of this electronically or print a copy for your records because it is an official communication from USAC. So this is the part where I am going to jump back into the uh, presentation and I am going to instead share a particular file. So just wait a moment while I am selecting the appropriate slide to jump back into. Sorry, I have to scroll quite a bit to get there. Okay, fast walk through. Okay. Getting there. Almost there, I promise. Okay. Here we go. So this slide shows a copy of what the Form 486 notification email looks like. So again, you'll have a couple of attachments at the top. So you can print the PDF for your records or you could save both of the files electronically. And again, the instructions for accessing the notification letter in the E-Rate Productivity Center under the notification section. If you want some more guidance on the Form 486, you can look on the USAC website. They have a particular page that talks all about the Form 486, or you can see USAC's video on filing that particular form um, by going to their video section. So let's talk about the few changes that you can make after receiving a funding commitment and you've already accepted the funding, you filed the Form 486. There are some limited circumstances in which you can make some changes. We call these post-commitment requests. So the changes that you can make after getting your funding commitments include filing an appeal. So if you think USAC made some kind of mistake, like they rejected your funding entirely and that was incorrect, or if they didn't fund you in the correct amount, anything along those lines, you have 60 days after the funding commitment is issued in order to file an appeal. You can also make service substitutions if the product or service you were going to purchase is not available for some reason. You can file spin changes to change the information about the service provider you're using. And you also can file a Form 500 to make several different changes, like maybe you need a deadline for installing your Category 2 equipment, or you need to reduce or candle fund cancel funding that you're not going to use. Anytime you make a post-commitment request, once that request is reviewed, USAC will issue a Revised Funding Commitment Decision Letter, or RFCDL. It looks a lot like the original funding commitment information you received, but it will potentially show a different amount of funding or will have notes at the end to indicate the changes that were made. So let's talk a little bit more about these options. So again, an appeal uh, needs to be filed with USAC within 60 days of receiving your funding commitment decision letter. And that's where you're talking to the program administrator uh, directly about you know, some kind of error that was made um, to your funding commitments. Um, if for some reason USAC couldn't resolve the issue and you still disputed, you would later have to file an appeal directly with the FCC. Uh, but most of the time, um, if there's some kind of dispute, you can just file an appeal with USAC and resolve the issue that way. And of course, USAC has more information about filing appeals on their website. I'll be glad to assist you with filing an appeal if needed. You can also, of course, make service substitutions. 
So this is somewhat more common with category two services, say in an instance where you intended to buy a particular make and model of equipment and it's no longer available for some reason. So a service substitution would say, I was originally going to buy this particular firewall, but I'm gonna to have to file, I request a different firewall instead. Um, so a service substitution has to be for similar functionality. So if you are changing you know, the information about a firewall, you can substitute another firewall for it, but you can't do something like, oh, I originally requested funding for this particular firewall, and now I wanna buy a rack instead, because those aren't similar functionality. Now, the trick is with um, the service substitutions is that you can't receive more funding than what was originally committed. So if you um, are getting a piece of equipment that uh, costs less than what the original piece of equipment um, cost, you're going to get your discount on the lower amount for that substituted piece of equipment. So your funding commitment will actually be changed to reflect the correct amount of funding you should receive. However, if the substituted piece of equipment is more expensive, you're just gonna be out the, the difference. You can get the maximum amount of funding originally requested, but you're not gonna be given any extra funding just because that substituted piece of equipment costs more. The deadline to request a service substitution is the last date for invoicing for that particular funding request. And again, instructions are on the USAC website if you need them. Next up would be spin changes. So there are a couple of different types of spin changes. A corrective spin change is where you just accidentally listed the wrong spin to identify a company. So let's say you have internet access from AT&T. There are several different subsidiaries of AT&T that have different spin numbers with the E-rate program. So you need to make sure you have the right one. So in reality, you always had the same service provider. They were just misidentified with the funding commitment information. So this is just to correct that. It doesn't affect your amount of funding. The other type is an operational spin change. And that's where truly you had to switch to another provider. Uh, so let's say you had an agreement to start a particular service, buy some equipment, things like that. And for whatever reason, that vendor is just not able to hold up their end of the bargain. Uh, in that situation, you may have to seek another service provider in order to get that same service or same product. Um, so keep in mind, this isn't just, oh, I found a better price from somebody else. This is a situation where maybe the original company went out of business um, or for whatever reason, you've been trying to get the service set up and they are just not responding. So you have to go with somebody else. So in that case, um, if funding has already begun for a service and you had to suddenly switch mid-year, you would actually get your funding split up between the original funding request for services provided by the original provider. And then you would have another funding request where the remaining funds were switched to another company. So it's not super common for that to happen. And I can only think of maybe two or three instances where a library needed to do this in the past few years. Um, but obviously I will be glad to assist you with either type of spin change. And then that brings us to the Form 500, which has several different functions. You can use the Form 500 to adjust the service start date on a Form 486. You can use that to um, adjust the contract expiration date. So if there were some kind of data entry error or, um, I don't know, for some reason the contract had to be extended, um, you may be requesting that. A lot of times the contract expiration, uh, making that adjustment is coupled with asking for an extension to deliver those service to, services to you or to install category two equipment. So for example, you were having a bunch of equipment installed um, in a renovated building or a newly constructed branch, construction delays are pretty common. So your service provider might not be able to install that equipment by the normal deadline. 
So you may have to ask for an extension. It's automatically going to be one year. And you may need to adjust the contract with that original service provider so that you know, the contract is still valid during the time period when the, the equipment will actually be purchased and installed. You can also use the Form 500 to cancel funding or reduce the amount of funding. Um, once you do this, you can't change that back. So remember that this is uh, irrevocable once you've selected this option. Uh, mostly this is relevant for Category 2. So if for some reason you decided to not go through with the purchase of equipment during a particular funding year, maybe you're going to try again the next year, you need to return that funding to the E-rate program to make it available again in your library's Category 2 budget. And for some previous funding years, you may still have to notify USAC about um, equipment that was transferred, say, from a branch that was closed to another branch within your library system. So that requirement to make a notification uh, within three years of installing the equipment that received E-rate discounts, uh, that was continuing through funding year 2021. For funding year, or funding year 2020, starting with funding year 2021, uh, you no longer have to file a Form 500 for that purpose. And this is just a note about you know, how you file the form. Uh, the Form 500 is now entirely online. And for funding year 2016 and forward, um, you're just filing the form electronically. If for some bizarre reason you needed to go back to funding year 2015 or prior, you have to fill out a paper copy of the Form 500 and then you upload it in the system. Uh, I don't think that's going to be relevant anymore. I probably should have just taken the note off, but I just wanted that noted in case that bizarre scenario comes up. So now we're just about ready to wrap up right on time. So if you have you know, questions about E-rates, um, you may want to look at some various online resources. KDLA posts information about E-rate on its website. And we have various archived webinars for different aspects of E-rate form filing. Uh, for general program information, you can go to the website for USAC. Uh, they have a, a section for the E-rate program. Because USAC administrates several different universal service fund programs, and E-rate is just one of them. You can also contact the USAC Client Service Bureau if you need assistance, say with logging into the E-rate Productivity Center portal or any kind of issues with you know, navigating the system, you can give them a call. You can also create cases within the E-Rate Productivity Center. And of course, USAC has its own training page. And if you haven't already, you may want to sign up for the Kentucky Tech Listserv. Um, I post reminders about uh, E-Rate form filing on this listserv. I also post things to the director's listserv. So you can contact me directly and I can add you or you can send a blank message to the email address listed on the screen. And this webinar has been recorded and we will eventually post the link on KDLA's archive webinars page. There's a section for E-rates. So just click on the E-rate link on the archive webinars page and that will take you to all of the wonderful trainings we've offered um, in the past year. So I want to thank you very much for attending. Um, and I will make a note, Melissa, about adding you to the listserv. Just a sec. All right, so this last page, I have a link to a survey for this particular training. So I've just added the link to SurveyMonkey in the a chat area so you can go ahead and fill that out and you should receive an email with a link to the survey later. Um, if you are watching an archived version of this recording, we would also appreciate your feedback. Um, it's very useful for our federal reporting because we do receive funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So again, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or call me and I will hang out for a few minutes in case 